Okay, Kath, you're up. Okay, thank you. Welcome everybody. And I am delighted to introduce uh, Luke Greeley, who is a PhD candidate in Ed Theory Organization and Policy at the Graduate School of Education. He is the former assistant dean at Rutgers Business School in Newark, and he is now an assistant professor of professional practice at the Rutgers Business School in Newark. Um, Luke's research uh, looks at philosophy to study the intersections of education, economics, and the environment. Currently, his research focuses on consumer education and consumer movements in relation to the larger democratic and economic trends. So his uh, work is just spot on for what's going on in the larger world. And today's uh, presentation is based on his dissertation research. And the title of the presentation is Toward a Reconceptualization of Consumer Education. So welcome, Luke, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lug, for uh, the introduction. Thank you, Colleen, for, for uh, inviting me to participate in the Brown Bag series and setting this up. Uh, I know quite a bit of work goes into organizing, organizing these series, so I, I appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for, for joining this, uh, this brown bag in this session. Um, so my, my hope today is uh, to do kind of a, a brief overview uh, of some of the main themes of my dissertation. I, I don't want to get too deep into uh, the, the philosophy and bore you to death, but uh, perhaps touch on some of the main themes of um, normative ethics, which, is, uh, which drives my dissertation. Um, and so I guess before, before I dive in, uh, just to say a little bit more about myself and how I arrived at the topic of consumer education. Um, as, as Kath mentioned, uh, I work at the business school where I've been for uh, about eight or nine years now. And uh, I teach classes there in business ethics um, and introductory business courses. And so that's kind of, uh, as I read and study and teach the literatures coming out of that field, uh, I've also been a PhD student now at the GSE for the last six or seven years and studying um, historical and philosoph uh, philosophical methods. Um, with Dr. Lug and Dr. Giarelli primarily. Um, and so uh, that combined with my, my undergraduate uh, background, which I was in religious studies and sociology, I kind of am drawing from a lot of different fields, which I think will come through in, in my presentation today. Um, so let's go ahead and, and dive in here. Uh, I want to start, hopefully I, we can keep this pretty informal and conversational. I just have a, a question kind of to get our, our thinking uh, going on this topic is, is for you all. Um, what does it mean to be a consumer? Uh, what, what are some of your thoughts on when you hear, hear the term consumer? Uh, what does that elicit or how does that formulate an idea in your mind of, of what a consumer is? Anyone wanna hop on or give their thoughts? Keith? A consumer is somebody who purchases something or using or uses something. Purchases or uses something. Okay. And we have a chat in the chat buying products. Oh, and another. Got a few yeah. things in the chat there. Okay, let me buy buying or using a product seems to be the consensus there. Yeah, certainly. So uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard the term, we live in a consumer society, right? And we, we often associate the term consumer with this kind of economics orientation, right? We, we go out into the marketplace and, and make some choices um, about what we want to purchase. Um, I see Ravi in the chat here has mentioned using a resource. Right, so there is a, this broader idea of, of consumption, which I, I wanna get into a little bit today, where consuming can also mean 
uh, consuming energy from the environment, right? Uh, pulling resources such as food, materials, supplies uh, to create things, right? So um, that can be a definition of, of consuming, being a consumer. Um, and so it can mean a lot of different things, but in the field of, of education, it's, we've had a hard time historically with grappling with what it means to be a consumer in our society. Um, and so this notion of consumer education uh, historically has been, it, it's incorporated a lot of different topics uh, and subject areas and it's changed over time. And I'll, I'll get into this a little bit when we, when we look at the historical review of consumer education in, in the United States specifically. Um, but it can mean multiple things and cover topics such as your personal finances, uh, it can cover topics such as domestic self-production, right? So uh, kind of creating or uh, recycling products or sewing or um, kind of the domestic arts was a, a term that was used heavily in the, in the early uh, parts of the 20th century. Um, it can also, some other topics that consumer education has covered has been uh, how you can advocate for yourself as a consumer, right? So learning about different methods of consumer protection, uh, consumer advocacy, advocacy groups. So all these different kinds of areas have made for uh, a bit of confusion when it comes to consumer education. And down here at the bottom, I have many of the names that this big umbrella of consumer education uh, has been called within public schools in the United States. Uh, so home economics is uh, the classic one, which developed more, uh, more recently into family and con consumer sciences. Early it was called the domestic sciences, um, family resource management. And now uh, more recently, we've dropped a lot of the domestic side and focus specifically on financial literacy and family financial management. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about historically why that, that has happened. Uh, consumer education has been something that, that used to be a, a pretty big focus in the United States public school system. And, but it has been on a decades long decline since the 1980s. Um, the, the primary research uh, organization, which is the uh, American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences, uh, had a peak of about 50,000 members in the 1960s. It is down, down to under about 4,000 members. Uh, and in terms of enrollments, the number of students who are exposed to some sort of formal consumer education in the United States uh, it has become a very small percentage. And you can see here, uh, less than 8% uh, in 2012 of students in the United States get some sort of formal consumer education uh, in, in a given year. Historically, consumer education has been very gendered. So even though we, we know that men and, equal, men and women equally uh, are consumers out in the marketplace, uh, it doesn't mean that men and women have had equal exposure to consumer education curriculum. Um, and you can see here, it was heavily gendered in the mid-century, um, but even now it is still heavily, heavily gendered, even in the few places it's still being taught as a formal subject. Uh, with only about a third uh, of uh, the students taking it being males and the vast majority being female. So why, why am I interested in consumer education? Why am I concerned that there's been this big decline in consumer education uh, in the United States? Uh, well, for, for a host of reasons. At the, at the individual level, uh, the topics covered in consumer education can help make some help individuals make healthier choices. Uh, it can help them uh, ensure that they have uh, healthy financial situations. They make wise and informed decisions out, out in the marketplace. 
Um, and it can also develop a sense of empowerment too, right? When you, you have an understanding about uh, the different industries that, that exist in the economy um, and how to navigate those and, and make smart and wise choices, it can build a sense of empowerment. Uh, at the macro level, I think we're all well aware of, of the changes, challenges being posed by uh, climate change, um, but not just climate change, there's, there's studies showing that uh, pollution, uh, which results from the production of many of these goods and services that we, we buy on the marketplace, uh, have a, a really, uh, um, what I think is an outrageous impact on the health and livelihoods of, of people across the globe. Um, so pollution in the form of air pollution, uh, industrial waste, um, and the associated illnesses and cancers which result from them, they result in millions of deaths every year and have a really heavy aggregate cost on the world economy. Um, and kind of when you're thinking about the, these macro level trends, I, I think we're all pretty well aware that uh, multinational and global corporations uh, can very easily navigate uh, the, the regulatory environment uh, of national governments, right? If someone's cracking down too hard or establishing stringent regulations, they can move their operations to nations which don't have those regulations. And one of the only ways to keep global corporations in check might be organized consumer movements, right? Consumer awareness uh, and a desire for more ethically uh, produced consumer goods. So these are some of the reasons why, why I think consumer education is important. But uh, the goal of, of my dissertation, the research that I've been doing is to um, articulate what are the normative, uh, what are the normative grounds to educate consumers. I, and what I found in my, my initial and subsequent research is there's people from all, all different sectors uh, you know, and different disciplines making the case that we should be educating consumers because of the host of benefits it provides. But the problem is our schools are no longer doing it, right? Uh, either as a standalone consumer education discipline or as integrating consumer education into some of the other disciplines such as perhaps social sciences, the natural sciences. Um, so, this is something that I, I really wanted to focus in on and see what, what were the arguments uh, being formulated for consumer education uh, from different spheres and how these could possibly be integrated to make the case that we need to do a better job of educating consumers uh, in the public school system. If, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, the field of, of ethics, uh, essentially a normative argument just means uh, someone's making a claim about what you should do. And so these claims, they, they rely on systems of different values or different ideologies. Um, and they, they have an applied focus, right? So what actions should we take as a result of the application of these values? So what I, what I did in the dissertation is I broke these into three different groups uh, and that's what I'll spend the, the remainder of my presentation going into is what are some of the civic arguments that are being made for why it's good in, in a civic sense to have informed and educated consumers? What are the uh, economic reasons for educating consumers and what are the environmental reasons? And then finally, I try and integrate these uh, to conclude with a case, okay, now that we, we know that many different spheres of, of ethics are arguing for consumer education, what might uh, a new kind of integrated approach to consumer education look like for the 21st century? If anyone has any questions as, as I'm going through any of this, please feel free to, to hop in or unmute yourself or type questions in the chat. I'll, I'll pay attention to that as well. Uh, just in case you're curious, have studies like this been done before? Yes, they have. Um, 
So it, it is common for people to look at curriculums and, and try and make sense of what are the normative arguments for adjusting uh, the curriculums that we have in schools. So I just have some examples here about multicultural education. Uh, in my own area of teaching, uh, business ethics was not Ethics was not something that had been taught in business schools. People uh, presented normative arguments for why we should include ethics. And in more recent decades, uh, business schools have moved towards that model. So, so this is something that has been done before in scholarship. Uh, and, and I'm kind of basing my study uh, off these prior ones. Um, in my study, I'm, I'm using uh, a pragmatic approach. Uh, I especially draw on Dewey th throughout my, my dissertation. Um, and essentially, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with pragmatism, it tries to avoid uh, fixed ideological positions. So what Dewey would call the, the, the isms. Um, and when you see a dichotomy like, should we, uh, use resources or conserve, uh, conserve the environment. Uh, often uh, pragmatists would challenge these dichotomies and say, we need to think, of, think more holistically and broadly about the problem and think about what are the practical results of the way we're, we're formulating these ideas uh, in our minds and um, in, the decisions, in the decisions we make. Pragmatism also focuses not just on the epistemology, which would be your knowledge base, but on ontolo ontology. So those are questions about your character, right? What are the dispositions uh, needed for someone to be an educated, conscientious, and thoughtful consumer? Um, Dewey spoke a lot about what are the dispositions needed to be uh, a citizen within a de democracy. Um, so I try and integrate some of those ideas into my, my dissertation. Uh, as a result, it's very interdisciplinary, as I mentioned before. I, I use history and philosophy primarily, but I also look at sociological, economic, and ecological research. And, and focusing on these practical outcomes is really important uh, when we're facing in what I perceive as an existential threat, right? The ecological and climate challenges that our generation and future generations uh, are facing. Um, you know, all, all the signs point that we can't wait any longer. So I, I think consumer education might be uh, a mechanism to kind of interweave uh, these ideas into, uh, into the K through 12 and higher ed curricula. So looking at the, the history of consumer education in the United States, um, it's gone through many different, many different phases uh, over the years. Um, it, it initially started with uh, some very gendered and kind of racialized overtones for what, was a, what a proper home environment should look like and who was responsible, i.e. Uh, women were responsible for making sure that there was a safe and healthy home environment. And so when ho home economics was created in, in the early 1900s, uh, it was during this time where there's increased uh, waves of immigration coming into the United States. And there was a lot of racialized stereotypes about uh, immigrants keeping a, a safe and sanitary home versus um, people who were already in the United States and, and value judgments being laid upon them. And so, in the, in the K through 12 school system, it was proposed that there should be a subject area to help in, incorporate and indoctrinate people into a proper uh, raising children in a proper home. Um, but also what's going on at this time, right, is during the industrial revolution, you're moving from a society which is primarily agricultural in focus, where you have, you know, domestic self-production where your food, a lot of the goods and clothing you make, you would, would be self-generated at home on a farm versus in the more industrial model when you're living in a city or a suburb, uh, individuals are now buying their food out on the market, buying products that previously they would have made themselves. 
And so they need to make decisions about what's safe, what's healthy. Um, and so kind of in this milieu of uh, the progressive era when um, there, there's many people being uh, concerned with snake oil salesmen and, and false marketing, uh, those issues are also being integrated into this idea of uh, home economics and the domestic sciences. Uh, the Great Depression brought about a, a massive shift in um, consumer education. Uh, and this shift was, was what I would identify as progressive in focus in that it tried to get consumers in the classroom to think about the bigger, uh, uh, broader scale issues, not just your individual choices at the market, but how do your choices relate to those around you? There's an emphasis on cooperatives and, and some of the first consumer advocacy groups started during the depression. Um, if you've ever heard of the magazine Consumer Reports that began in the 1930s, and there's many others like it in which uh, there was, they were trying to disseminate information about price and qualities uh, amongst one another so that people could understand uh, some of the challenges in the marketplace and get them on an equal footing with producers. Um, these distinctions between uh, who produces and who consumes these kind of very gendered distinctions, they, they have a thread throughout the history of consumer education. Um, and it, it's something I tried to bring to the fore in my study. Um, and so when I was looking at the primary sources of what were the actual textbooks and curricular material being used at this time, they, they are uh, extremely gendered. Uh, they make very moralistic statements about, um, you know, if you're not spending wisely or you're not able to balance your budget, that's a moral problem. It's not so much looking at uh, the question of, you know, are people being paid a living wage? So th th these are kind of critical distinctions I try and make uh, throughout the, the historical study that I did. Um, down here, I have a quote from JFK uh, about consumer education because during its peak in the 1950s and 60s, uh, several presidents, not just JFK, Ford, Nixon, they all made public comments about the importance of educating consumers. Um, they, they established federal agencies to try and help protect consumers, uh, to try and help disseminate information. Uh, JFK actually said that uh, that United States citizens had a right to consumer education, that it should be established as a right. Um, and so I just think, I, I just wanna highlight that, that this was sort of the peak period uh, of consumer education and interest in it in the United States. In the 1970s, um, following uh, a lot of the civil rights era, the women's liberation movement, there was an effort to kind of, uh, to try and degender the curriculum. And this is where um, uh, eventually they end up changing the name from home economics to consumer science, right? In this notion to say that this is, uh, this is broader, it, it shouldn't be gendered. Um, but also kind of while this is going on, uh, the economy goes, uh, goes into a dive a bit and the question becomes how well are schools preparing people for careers, right? So not so much preparing people for, for home life or healthy, uh, healthy living, but how can schools help our workforce be more competitive? Uh, and so you really see a decline in consumer education in, in the 1980s to now, um, where as Obama famously said that uh, we want our school systems to help students be career and college ready, right? And because that focus is on the productive, quote unquote, productive side of the economy, uh, this notion of educating consumers has taken a backseat and fallen out of favor in the curriculum. There's been a little bit of uptick, from, uptick following the, the recession of 2008 um, to promote financial literacy. And this is, I'm pretty cynical about this uptick in interest in financial literacy because it's focused on consumer responsibility. And many of in the fields of economics were pointing fingers at um, individuals who took out mortgages, who perhaps had 
poor terms or that for they couldn't afford. So they're pointing blame at the consumers and that's why uh, there is an advocacy for, for the education of responsible consumers uh, in, in the recent decade. New Jersey is one of uh, only, I think, 14 states right now, which mandates a financial literacy component uh, in its curriculum. And the New Jersey mandate has students, I believe it's a, a half a year of financial literacy course uh, being taught in high schools. Okay, so now that you kind of understand where consumer education has come through in some of the major trends, uh, I want to dive into what, what are some of the nor normative arguments that have been made historically and contemporarily about, you know, why we should have consumer education. Um, the civic frame kind of looking at this idea of how do we have a, a promote a healthy society, a healthy democracy, um, it kind of looks at what are the aggregate effects of when consumers have uh, skills and knowledge um, in these areas. So one is that kind of aggregating individual benefits, right? If you have improved health, financial stabi stability, you're protected from unscrupulous businesses. This is good for our communities. It, it will um, make, we'll have a, a more thriving society. Uh, and then the civic frame also tries to connect this to larger democratic movements, right? So that when we organize together and see each other both as fellow consumers and citizens, uh, you know, if we share resources and knowledge uh, that we can act in coordinated movements uh, as counterweights to corporate influence. And you, you can see this in, in the form of boycotts uh, being used both contemporarily or during the civil rights era. Uh, boycotts were, were integrated into these kinds of um, larger civic issues and civic questions. Uh, I, I use Dewey as kind of the theoretical underpinning for, for the civic frame. Um, and so Dewey in a, a, a book he wrote, The Public and Its Problems in 1927, he focuses on a lot of these issues about how we live in such a complex world that it's really hard for the individual to understand or make, make sense of them. Uh, so I have some, some quotes here from that book. Uh, that I think are very enlightening and they sound uh, not too different from the forces and problems that we face uh, today in the 21st century, right? That there's such complex webs of uh, economics and social concerns going on that it can be really difficult for the individual to, to make sense and, and to understand them. And so that the problem of a democracy is how you can organize or become aware of this knowledge uh, how you can share it through uh, productive communication so that um, we can address the, these public problems that, that arise. And so what Dewey proposes is that we, we need to think systematically about how individuals come about uh, the process of ascertaining information and making sense and deciding to act upon them. Um, and so, you know, he says that that's the problem of the public is how we can form better mechanisms for communicating um, these different issues we, we face as a society, what the consequences of those interactions are. He, he spends a lot of time focusing on economics, economic interactions in particular, and, and the negative consequences that can arise from them. And so how can we have processes of inquiry and, di and dissemination to help the public make better sense of them? So one of the ways he proposes is that our, our governments or nonprofit system help the research, help the public to research uh, these problems, provide them information so that they can make, uh, make a decision. And so, you know, Dewey, Dewey's arguing not that the public needs to be scientists in and of themselves, but that they have the ability to judge uh, some of the, the, the information that's being put forth by scientists um, or by, you know, experts in various fields. So, so experts, public institutions play a really big role in ensuring that, um, that we as individuals can understand what's going on in the world around us and make informed judgments. 
and act with others to intervene at the state level. So the second kind of normative framework that, that I uh, look at in my dissertation is economics, specifically neoclassical economics. And if you're familiar with neoclassical economics, it's all about uh, transactions, right? So many individuals acting in self-interest. Um, and if those individuals act in self-interest, it will create a greater good. Um, and so it looks at consumers trying to optimize their decisions, trying to maximize utility, um, and that the market acts as an arbiter to, to um, see who's gonna succeed and who's gonna fail within a society. And the application of these neoclassical principles to uh, public policy are what are referred to as, or as market rationalists. And they make, they make a normative argument that governments should facilitate and protect free market economic interests because it improves the well being of citizens. And the way they do that is through this idea of efficiency. So, Efficiency essentially just says that resources are opt optimally al allocated um, to serve the preferences of individuals and it minimizes waste and provides the lowest cost price uh, possible to the consumer. And if you follow the logic, which I'm not saying I agree with, but if you follow the logic of a neoclassical economics, uh, the efficiency requires information symmetry, which essentially means consumers have the same amount of information as producers and that consumers act in rational ways. And so you can never have, uh, you can never have efficiency in this economic framework if, if consumers are not educated, right? It implies that consumers should be educated so that they can find information, make sense of it and make rational decisions based upon that information they find around them. Um, so, and, and market rationalists all the time, they, they argue against regulation and, and one of the reasons they argue against it is because they believe that consumers uh, are sovereign, that they, they should be responsible for protecting their own self-interest interest and directing uh, this efficient marketplace. So whether or not you agree with this is not so much important as what they're they're proposing, right? Their, their whole system and framework of thought implies, uh, implies that consumers should be educated. So moving on to the environmental frame that I use, before I do, I, I just wanna take a pause to look at where one of the biggest movements right now in, in the space of environmental education is, is in this kind of sustainability framework. And if you're familiar with the UN Sustainable, Goal, Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs, uh, I provide a, a quote from one here because they have uh, some pretty straightforward language about what they believe consumer, uh, the importance of consumer education, but how they, uh, how they formulate consumer education, I think is somewhat problematic, right? So uh, essentially what they advocate for here is that Consumers should have adequate information through standards and labels to ensure that people can live us in a sustainable lifestyle. Okay, well, it's really vague and they don't provide much definition as to what being uh, using a sustainable lifestyle is, what it means to be in harmony with nature. Um, and so while I'm not critiquing the, the goals of the SDGs, I'm just saying that they haven't provided much clarity if you think about it in, in a philosophical sense. And they also are putting forth an information deficit model, uh, which is not the best educational model uh, that we have for teaching uh, about things like consumer education. Um, and down here, I have a quote because one of the, the philosophers I use um, is, is Hans Jonas and Martin Heidegger, who are very focused on this, these kind of ontological questions about what does it mean to exist in the world 
Um, and the quote here I have is, human beings are never isolated subjects separate and distinct from the public world. Structured by being in the world, we are always being with others uh, and others exercising an elemental control over us. And so I try and push in the dissertation on this notion that it's about individual choices, that sustainability is not about individual choices, but it's about it's about our existence in this world around us, both with non-human and human actors, to try and move against kind of this uh, a more anthropocentric uh, orientation. So the, the, two, uh, the two main takeaways that I, I try and take from the environmental normative framework is that all human activity whether, whether we call it economically productive or not, has a consumptive element, right? In that it's drawing energy and natural resources from the environment. Um, and the environmental frame also asks that we reorient away from self-interest, advocating an economic par paradigm and towards a more symbiotic relationship with the environment. And so what I'm trying to say here is that um, it is that we need to think about problems, not in this economy versus environment uh, kind of dichotomy, but instead think about how does the environment contribute to our existence, our well-being, and that the health of that environment will have a tremendous impact on our health as, as human beings. That we can't have this kind of false distinction between humanity and nature. So just in summary, the, the main takeaways from each of these, each of these frames, uh, the civic frame is about issues, issues of public interest, how they're communicated and disseminated uh, within a, a democratic society and how we can improve the betterment of, of citizens within it. The economic frame is looking at issues of being informed and rational and promoting an efficient marketplace. And the environmental frame is challenging an anthropocentric worldview and instead encourages a reconceptualization of how we consume and what it means to consume uh, within the biosphere. So, so some of the challenge, challenges as I'm concluding my, my dissertation as we speak, um, in, my, in my concluding chapter is how, how I can integrate these different frames because it seems like there's problems that are unreconcilable. And the, the two main tensions I see are between individualistic and social concerns and in between anthropocentric and e ecological concerns. And the, the way I try and resolve them, uh, I, I outlined here in these four bullets, um, is to, to understand that individual actions always have an aggregate effect and both and, and also that individual actions never happen in isolation, right? We, we operate in a social milieu uh, that our cultural understandings of the world uh, impact how we make those ind individual decisions. Um, and that we can never make purely economic decisions. There's always an ethical element uh, to our decision and there's always a socially con constituted element. I also want to challenge the anthropocentric versus ecological concern because environmental damage is ultimately going to have uh, an anthropocentric consequence, right? If we damage our environment, it is going to hurt us both uh, economically and our, in our health and, and, and our well being. So the question is how can we, how can we sort of uh, measure, quantify, in, in an economic terms, these hidden and external costs into our financial tr transactions. And then finally, I, I do think that, that the actual, the economic frame can give us um, with its notions of efficiency and subjective value, can give us a, an opening uh, to kind of use consumer education to improve uh, environmental outcomes because if value is subjective to the, to, to the buyer, if we can get buyers and consumers to weight the, uh, the environmental and social consequences of their purchasing decisions as much as, as the cost, uh, we can call that self-interest, right? 
we can kind of change the notion of how we're viewing self-interest and, and what that means in our, in our broader economy. So using kind of this, this integrative approach, um, I propose a couple different things or, or ways that we can look at consumer education moving forward. One is through uh, the engaged institutional model where institutions reframe who consumers of its, its research and teaching are to incorporate community and public interests, uh, and also to view institutions to view themselves as consumers, right? Because they make decisions about, uh, uh, about buying equipment and resources. Um, so oftentimes educational institutions are some of the largest consumers within a regional economy. So the decisions they're making, the way they formulate consumption uh, is going to be really important moving forward. And then if you're looking kind of at the pedagogical and curricular um, pr prescriptions that, that we might use for consumer education, it's that people need to be taught the skills of inquiry and ex experimentation, but that they, they should um, use these skills towards problems of practical and personal interest to them, right? So what are some of those life skills uh, those difficult decisions that you and I might face on the marketplace, um, you know, between looking at the low cost item, looking at its environmental impact, how we can reconcile what, what decision to make uh, using all of these different values. Uh, we, can use, we can use the sciences, um, we can use social studies, we can use math to inform uh, and kind of illuminate many of these questions uh, these, and these ethical concerns of the consumer. Uh, I propose a couple of heuristics that consumers, uh, that we can use in consumer education. So some I provide here to look at, um, to help consumers understand which industries are, are, are most, general understanding of how supply chains and industry work to understand where the most common moral wrongs or moral quandaries arise. Uh, so that might be industrial agriculture, it might uh, look at um, garment production, right? So that's, that's heuristic one, what are the areas most likely to give rise to a moral wrong? Two are to, to look at problems that have a greater degree of impact or scale, right? So our decisions about uh, what vehicle or trans mode of transportation to use will have a much, should have much greater importance or significance to the consumer and, and the amount of time they spend researching and considering it versus perhaps uh, what pencil to buy when, when they're at Office Max or Staples. Um, and ultimately the idea is to reduce suffering and harm so that research uh, into these areas should only uh, should only be applied to to the degree it it doesn't it doesn't have an exorbitant cost. So individuals who might be uh, suffering because they're in poor economic circumstances or in poor health, uh, they have less of a moral impetus uh, to spend time on this because they have less uh, lower resources, lower ability to do so. Um, and finally, I would just add to these suggestions that. Uh, this is not an individual problem. This is in a collective imperative and that we all have a moral, um, we all have a moral obligation to put time and interest to make sure that we're addressing these ethical questions. Skip this part. And so there's been some positive developments recently outside of the schools, right? So. Uh, there's many uh, vibrant online and digital kind of consumer movements that are going on. You might have heard some of these terms before, such as minimalism, food activism, slow fashion. Uh, these are going on outside the schools where people are giving each other resources and information about uh, how they can um, pursue a more a less impactful um, lifestyle. But I, I think they're, they can give us uh, some suggestions about what we can bring into school that people are interested in doing. And I don't mean to say that consumer education is a, is a panacea. It's going to solve all of our problems, 
but I think it's a very effective entry point because of how many people agree across all these different normative perspectives, whether it's economic, civic, or environmental, that it can be a great entry point into broader political issues. Um, and at a time when people are feeling cynical about conventional politics, uh, consumer movements might be a way uh, to make a meaningful difference in our society. So I, I hope that wasn't too much for you all. Um, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, address any comments you have about what I've presented. I have a quick question, if it's all right. Um, first of all, great presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I actually think I have two questions. One of my questions was the extent to which there's still kind of a gender division in consumption practices across the globe, because I think I read somewhere that there is, but I'm curious about the extent to that and um, whether, you know, whether you envision consumer education being able to kind of address or shift those norms or speak to those norms. Um, and my second question was around like practices of overconsumption, like at a um, basically what the patterns of like per people in the global north consuming more perhaps than like is sustainable. Like, do you think consumer education um, should kind of speak to like the patterns on a structural level and how they, they can be um, perhaps, I guess, on the individual and collective level um, shifted? But yeah, thanks, great presentation. And those are my questions. Thank you, Olivia. And th those are great questions. And, and definitely uh, they're, they're ones that uh, I, I try to address in my work and I think we need to address moving forward. So on, on the, the gendered, uh, the question of gendered, it still to this day, I think as long as there's these kinds of stereotypes about um, who, uh, who the workers are and who's doing kind of domestic type of work, um, there's, there's going to be this question about who's, the, who's consumers, who are consumers. And what, what I aim to do is if we, if we think about consumption more broadly, right, that we, we are all consumers, right? If we get it outside of this perspective of what's going on in the home, just like us as individuals from a, a biological standpoint are consumers, right? I think that could be a way to help kind of degender uh, what's gone on historically in, in consumer education curriculum. Um, I think also to see that manufacturing processes are actually consumptive, right? Because they're pulling resources from the environment. Um, it, can sh it can show that uh, extraction uh, is is industrial in industrial work is a type of consumption could perhaps help degender uh, in that regard as well. Your question about the global north and global south is a great one. Um, yeah, it, I think that's one of the biggest. <laughs> it's one of the biggest problems here, right? So uh, a lot of times now the production of goods and services that that we consume doesn't occur in our backyard, so to speak we are completely uh, oblivious or unaware as to the consequences of those, uh, of those productive operations. Early on in the presentation, I gave some stats on pollution. Much of that pollution is impacting the global south, not us uh, in, in the developed world. And so the result is that because we don't have the information about these global supply chains and what's going on in other countries, uh, as consumers, if, if we did have that information, we might make other choices, right? Or choose not to, uh, not to buy a particular product. Um, so I, I do see consumer education, that's a big piece of this, is bringing to light just what kinds of economic activities uh, and the, the either intended or unintended environmental consequences of those economic activities, what they have for people uh, who are living and working in, in the global south. 
Great questions. Uh, and anyone else uh, want to chime in or? Feel free to use the chat if you prefer. <clears throat> This is a bit outside of your dissertation, but one of the big surprises of the COVID uh, pandemic is that it's related to global warming and environmental devastation because of the search for uh, arable land uh, and the uh, quest for uh, greater meat. There, uh, there's, and this is Lori Garrett's work looking for uh, uh, pangolins as a uh, bush meat. And that's where they think the transmission route is. You reduce the uh, environmental or the uh, arable land, you reduce um, habitat. Then you, you know, the pangolins are in, contaminated by the bats. People eat the pangolins and boom, you've got a global virus. And she argues that if we don't get a handle on all of this, that you know the next uh, global pandemic is, with a novel virus is just around the corner because of the rampant consumerism. I know it's not your <laughs> dissertation, yeah. but it has immediate implications. Yeah, it, it certainly does. Um, I, I think there's, well, oh, I, I, I don't particularly uh, spend much time focusing on uh, things like, you know, fossil fuel consumption, or meat production and consumption in the paper, because I'm, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, more of a big picture framework. Uh, I do think it, it can provide an effective uh, way to approach a problem like that, right? Mm -hmm. to, the interconnected nature of environmental and economic problems and, and the consequences that they'll, they can have in destabilization for, for society across the globe. Um, so that, that's really fascinating, Kath. I'd be interested in, in reading, reading that work. But it, it, those are the types of problems that I think, um, I think a, a critical consumer education could help address, right? Because they pose these, the one slide I skipped over is I, I borrowed a little from critical media literacy. They have these guiding questions for how to look at a source mm -hmm. and try to adapt them or I'm working on adapting them for thinking about questions for conscious consumerism. Mm -hmm. And what I do here is I'm, I'm I'm saying that in say perhaps a classroom scenario where we're doing more of an investigative problem posing curriculum that we could present a problem like you, you've suggested, right? The search for meat uh, mm -hmm. in different parts of the globe. What, who are the people or resources that were used in the, that went to create that product, right? Mm -hmm. Why was it being produced? Um, who were the people and companies involved in its delivery, right? What, what values, points of view, and ideologies are being represented? Um, so I, I think that's, that's a great example of how we could use these specific questions, right? Mm -hmm. um, one one uh, case that I like to use uh, in my classes is asking students to think about something like their smartphones, which they use all the time. What went into making that smartphone get into their hand, right? What are the resources, the people that, that went into its production? What is, what is the design of that smartphone represent? It is not an ethically neutral product. And I'm not saying that the, there's something inherently wrong with the smartphone or any other technology, but I think we can use uh, edu formal education to give students the tools to research those questions and assess their own values and be a little bit reflective about whether those products or services they're using represent uh, an outlook that they think is, is, uh, morally, uh, is morally desirable in, in, in our modern society. Ravit just made a comment in the chat. I don't know if you wanted to yeah, Ravid, that's 
that's a great point. So he says environmental justice, economic justice, and social justice are linked to our human health and the health of the planet. And we barely tackle any of these issues in schools. I agree. <laughs> I agree 100. percent And I, th I think that the that consumer education might be an entry point to get them. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, um, so I think that's a great point um, to. Uh, as an entry point into our schools, because there's such consensus, you know, across the political spectrum that people need to have kind of life skills, right? Everyone complains that people don't know how to balance a budget, right? Or that people buy, spend their money wastefully, right? I think these are an entry point that, you know, we, you can get 99% of the American population agreeing with statements like that we can say, right, it's because we're not educating our, educating ourselves as consumers. And then we use it almost as a Trojan horse to get this more critical consciousness going because it, it automatically elicits these broader questions about what's going on in, in the broader economy and how those goods and services got to us. Luke, I have a quick question for you. Just kind of following from that, are there other folks in schools of education working on this? Because it seems like a lot of your research is tying together a lot of different disciplines. And I haven't seen a lot of conversation in schools of ed about conscious consumerism. Yeah, there, there's not. Uh, <laughs> well, one problem is that uh, I think philosophy has is fallen by the wayside in schools of education. Um, as well as, as history and many of the other, uh, many of the, those other disciplines that give us this broader background as schools of ed move uh, more towards uh, other models. Um, so without getting into too much detail on that, no, I don't, I don't think schools of ed are, are looking at this issue very much. Uh, there is a dwindling number of consumer science um, programs at a, a small number of colleges and universities in the United States um, that are doing some actually good research on this, right? So uh, the people that are still left in the family and consumer sciences field uh, are doing some great research. One is um, Susan McGregor is a name I, I go back to a lot where she's trying to integrate environmentalism uh, into consumer education. Um, and consumer ed curriculum that still exists in a limited number of K through 12 schools. Um, so I, uh, the idea of the dissertation is just to get people thinking about these problems, think about uh, you know, the, the broad philosophical perspectives about why we need to address them and hopefully make the case that, that we start talking about them in, in schools because if we don't address uh, the, some of these problems, it has enormous implications uh, for, for future generations and, and the health of the planet. So we're just about at one o'clock, but um, there is one more question in the chat from Kristen. Um, I, you know, obviously if you need to move on to other meetings or work, but um, I don't know, Luke, if you wanna just take that last question. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm happy to stay on as, as long as folks have questions. Uh, if, if you need to leave, feel free. Um, so as Kristen mentioned about the presidential quotes, yeah, I, I, I was shocked at how much, uh, I'll go back to that JFK quote that you've referenced. Um, yeah, there's JFK um, had, had a number of quotes, uh, Johnson as well. Um, talking about the importance of protecting consumers and educating them. And it's unfortunate, it's really fallen out of favor as uh, an area of political interest. Um, it, it, and it's in, in both parties, there, there was a little bit of, of, of change with the uh, consumer, uh, consumer, finance, consumer Protection Financial Bureau uh, that was started with uh, Elizabeth Warren under the Obama administration that got gutted in the last four years, as, as you can imagine. Um, but that, that's focused mostly on financial protection and, and education uh, and not so much uh, on, on broader issues of regulation and health and safety uh, in other areas of the economy. 
but yeah, there's, there's some great history here. Uh, I'd be happy to share uh, that chapter of my dissertation uh, or, or any of it with, with, you, with you all if you're interested. Yeah, I was super curious, especially like thinking about when you were saying like the goal of reducing waste or something like that for example, or like reducing harm. I was like, ooh, but judgments about like harm being moral can vary based on like what people consider to be moral or not. So like if I have a certain political ideology, maybe I don't consider like environmental waste to be a moral judgment because I don't consider that to be harm unless it's like a person or something sure. like that. Um, yeah. So I was thinking about all of that stuff, very uh, interested if you dipped your toe into any of that uh, literature. Yeah, and there, there, uh, there's some great literature on that. Uh, P Peter Singer spends some time uh, in his applied ethics work where he talks about um, whether non-human non -human entities can suffer, right? And so this question of that you just brought up harm and whether some people in their moral judgment believe that harm can be caused if it doesn't affect a human. Uh, I do try and get into that in, in my uh, environmental chapter. Hans Jonas is a great person uh, to read if you're interested in that topic. Um, but yeah, so, so I think just even the question though of are our decisions as a consumer causing harm. No matter how you define harm, the fact that we're, that we're not asking it to help students ask that and give them modes of inquiry to explore the question is like the first step. So I, me personally, I don't care where someone comes down on who, who falls into their sphere of harm, right? And you, and you can kind of see this too, where, I mean, people make different choices about uh, like, being a vegetarian versus a vegan, like where they draw the line as, as to harm. Um, I, I don't think schools should be making moral judgments about where, where a student should end up on those types of questions. They should just be helping individuals give, give them the, uh, the frameworks, the vocabulary, and kind of the information research tools to explore those questions for themselves and reflect and and pursue whatever values they think are worthy of pursuit. Um, and I think the, 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 those kinds of questions, uh, these ethical ambiguities, schools have traditionally had a hard time bringing into the curriculum, right? It's, it's probably why we don't do much ethics in, in our curriculum, whether it's not consumer ethics. Um, but I think questions of consumer education can help bring these ethical problems into schools in a way that people might be more comfortable with than say uh, like a straight straight up political discussion or something along those lines. Does anybody else have anything real quick or? All right, All right. I, think, I think that'll do it for today. Thanks Luke, that was great. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Uh, I, I hope you found it interesting. Please feel free to, to email me if you want to talk more about uh, talk more about any of this. And the slides will be on the PhD Sakai site shortly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Colleen. Appreciate good luck. Help. Good luck finishing up. Um, well, I should Thank stop. You. Stop the recording. <laughs>